Why didn't the United States Army and or British Army invade Berlin in 1945? Of course, some will note that during the Yalta Conference in February 1945, it was decided that Berlin would be in the Soviet occupation zone. As such, why waste troops for an area that would have to be surrendered to the Soviets anyway, especially since urban combat usually incurs heavy losses? Yet, there were some that wanted to go for Berlin. Elements of the 9th and 1st armies reached the Elbe River on 11th of April. Within two days, they had established a bridgehead on the east bank and were only 50 miles from Berlin. The way to Berlin appeared to be open. Simpson was poised to race for the capital when Eisenhower stopped him. Eisenhower wanted to mop up German forces both north and south of Simpson's position on the Elbe. Additionally, Stalin was also concerned that the Western Allies might go for Berlin, although Eisenhower stated otherwise. But Stalin had also apparently received a contradictory intelligence report warning that the Western Allies were about to launch an operation to seize Berlin, with forces under General Montgomery attacking north of the Ruhr along the shortest route to Berlin. To understand why the Western Allies did not go for Berlin, it is important to understand a. the positioning of the various armies and their ongoing operations, b. the manpower situation in general, c. the specific manpower situation due to the ongoing war in the Pacific, d. although the German forces were mostly beaten, this still could inflict some damage, e. that in some areas public order had to be restored and f. that the Soviets were not limited to Berlin neither. First off, let us look at the map of the 5th to 18th April 1945. You will notice that Berlin seems to be rather close. Yet at the same time you will also see that there is a Ruhr pocket in the middle. The pocket was split in two parts, the eastern part surrendered on the 16th of April and the western on the 17th of April. Why is this important? Well, if we look at the initial quote in this video, it was noted that on the 11th of April the bridgehead were just 50 miles from Berlin and dead. Simpson was poised to race for the capital when Eisenhower stopped him. Yet Simpson's 9th army was at that point at least in part still involved in mopping up the Ruhr pocket. Even though part of the 9th army was helping to reduce the Ruhr pocket, General Simpson still could provide for the eastward drive these four divisions plus the 102nd, which had begun to cross the Rhine, and the 83rd, recently relieved from the fight for the Ruhr. So this would make up about 6 divisions, which in overall is not much, if we consider that the final drive towards Berlin of the Soviets consisted of two fronts, one of which was Zhukov's first Belarusian front had no fewer than 18 armies, breaking down into 77 rifle divisions, 7 tank slash mechanized corps and 8 artillery divisions. Now keep in mind, Soviet divisions were generally smaller, Yet this was just one front. Additionally, US forces took a lot of German prisoners in the Ruhr more than expected. The number of prisoners exceeded all expectations. Amounted to 317,000 men, twice the US intelligence estimate. The human herd rolled in, held in prisons of war cages that were little more than open fields with inadequate food and facilities. This of course bombed manpower as well, something discussed a bit later, although with a British example. Gian Greco summarizes the situation as follows. The Soviets, meanwhile, were already massed within striking distance of the capital and anxious to crush their Nazi beast in one final titanic blow. Eisenhower's forces were more dispersed than is commonly realized, had accomplished their part in the defeat of Germany and had other things to do. First, let us look at manpower. Although the United States had manpower problems, the situation was worse for the British. As Churchill in September 1943 noted about the planned invasion in Northwest Europe in 1944, we shall, Churchill admitted, be able to match the American expedition with nearly equal force of British divisions. But after the initial assault, the buildup must be entirely American, as I am completely at the end of manpower resources. As such, the British, just a few days short of Christmas 1944, began increasing their manpower at the front. And in what must have been a dreary Christmas present to the British people, the War Cabinet announced on 22nd December 1944 that it would add 250,000 to the ranks of Britain's soldiers by pulling behind the line men to the front, by transferring men from the Royal Air Force and other services and by combing more men out of civilian jobs. 
Yeah, when it comes to manpower, we also should not forget the bigger picture here. After all, the United States was engaged in the Pacific and Operation Downfall and the invasion of Japan was still planned at this point. It was a two-part operation. The first, Operation Olympic, I covered in this video. And for these operations, it was crucial that enough troops would be ready in the Pacific. The US Army planners had originally and optimistically believed that 2,442,000 men could be shipped to the Pacific from Europe and the United States, concurrent with 1.6 million to the United States. All on the transport ships projected to be available after the defeat of Germany. Unfortunately, the plans assumed that the Nazis would surrender by January 1945 and that nine months would be available for overseas movements. As such, the number for the men scheduled for the Pacific from Europe dropped down to 1.7 million in December 1944 and even as low as 1,074,000 in March 1945. Hence, every man was needed, especially since it was estimated that taking Berlin would incur about 100,000 losses. These men would be missed in the Pacific or as occupation forces in Europe. Now, some might call the assumption by the Western Allies that the Germans would surrender by January 1945 unreasonable. But we should not forget that in summer 1944, the Wehrmacht suffered two major defeats. The smaller one, yet better known, was D-Day and the following liberation of France. The lesser known happened to the Eastern Front, namely Operation Bagraton or Operation Bagraton, which led to the destruction of Army Group Center. To put it in perspective, the total German losses in the East for June, July and August 1944 then were 589,000. In contrast, the estimate for German losses on all other fronts, mainly in France, in the months June, July and August 1944, ticked together, was only 175,000. In August 1944 alone, the Germans lost 277,000 on the Eastern Front. To put this in perspective, in January 1943, when the losses in Stalingrad were at the highest, they were at 180,000. As such, the Allies were quite shocked when the Germans attacked in winter 1944. This is important to keep in mind because we know how the war turned out, yet the actors of the time could not. Which brings us to the next point. It was still a war, not a cakewalk. Although the Germans were mostly beaten, they still inflicted losses even in the last weeks of the war and locally could still achieve victories. Multiple of the 19th Corps spearheads reached the Elbe on April 12th and 13th and regimental commanders leading the battles to get across at Magdeburg, Schönebeck and Tangermünde were badly wounded within sight of the river. In several instances, key bridges on direct routes to Berlin were blown up in the faces of the attacking GIs. By the way, if you're interested in German tactics from that period, be sure to check out our crowdfunding campaign on the translation of the Sturmgeier 44 Assault Platoon Tactics pamphlet. Anyway, let us look at the specific case. The 2nd Armored Division crossed the Elbe with three infantry battalions, but the Germans counterattacked. As a result, the US forces had to withdraw again. Much of the force was successfully withdrawn across the Elbe on April 14th, and the disaster turned out not to be as bad as believed at the time when numerous groups, large and small, infiltrated back across the river on subsequent nights. Thankfully, it turned out that only 330 men had been lost. If you look at the bigger picture, namely the losses of both the Soviets and the US Army, for the specific time frame, it becomes even more apparent. The Soviets with their assault on Berlin clearly suffered the most losses, yet the US Army also sustained considerable losses as well, as Gian Greco points out. Soviet troops engaged the bulk of German strength and suffer 372,000 casualties, including 78,000 dead during their final 23-day assault on Berlin and central Germany. American casualties for essentially the same period would be 43,000 with 8,351 killed in action. Although Jesse Alexander from the Great War Channel and the 16 Days in Berlin documentary told me that the Soviet killed in action numbers might have been higher, according to Letissa's race for the Reichstag. By the way, you can follow Jesse on Twitter at Jesse underscore history. There's also a link in the description. Yet, were there were other problems as well, as Fennel points out. By the second half of April 1945, the problem of addressing the chaos into which Germany had fallen became almost as arduous as that of fighting the remnants of the Wehrmacht. 
Senior German police officers, especially of ardent Nazis, deserted their posts, undermining public order. Public health officials did likewise, facilitating the spread of disease. Looting became widespread, displaced persons, ex-prisoners of war and liberated slave workers, particularly Russians, were roaming about the country, roaming farms and terrorizing the local population. As such, Kruger's first corps was reassigned. Namely, instead of performing combat operations, its new assignment was to maintain the lines of communication and also sort out civilian affairs as well. And finally, we shouldn't forget that although some parts of Europe were not in Soviet occupation zone according to Yalta, the Western allies were also not too keen to let those be liberated by the Soviets and hand them over to Stalin. On 16 April, Eisenhower ordered Montgomery to turn 21st Army Group north to prevent the Soviets beating the Allies to Denmark. To summarize, although the Western Allies had crossed the Elbe River and were around 50 miles away from Berlin, the bigger picture makes it clear that there was little muscle behind the spearheads on the Elbe River. Eisenhower reminded Marshall that his center of gravity was far to the rear, and both commanders knew well that the soldier-intensive battle in Berlin would force the bulk of US forces east and commit them to a fight of unknown duration at the exact time that many European theater divisions had to be prepared for an about phase that would send them west. In other words, Eisenhower's forces were dispersed at the time, whereas the Soviet forces were far more concentrated. Berlin might have been an interesting prestige object, yet the United States was still committed in a war and the national war goals were clearly of a higher importance here. Well, I hope you learned something new. Big thank you here to Andrew for reviewing the script and providing viper input on the positions of the Allied forces, something I had completely missed. Thank you to Jesse Alexander from the Great War Channel and the 16 Days in Berlin documentary for answering questions and providing you with additional information for this video. Special thanks to DMG and Greco and be sure to check out the podcast with him. If you haven't already, it is rather short. Nah, just kidding. Thank you to all my supporters on Patreon and Subscribestar. As always, sources are listed in the description. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you for watching and see you next time.